Powerplay Chess, brought to you in association with Kagi. Hello everyone, my name is Svetlana and it is nice to see you again after the rest day at the FIDE Women's Candidates. Today was round 5 and the games were filled with a lot of action. One of the most interesting games from this round happened between Leiting J and Lagno Katerina, where a seemingly calm opening quickly turned into tactics and it was very instructive to see how both players handled it. The head-to-head -head score in classical between these two players is two draws and two wins for Lagno, even though Leiting J is slightly higher rated. So let's see which one of them can grab the initiative in this game. Leiting J playing as white starts with e4 and Lagno Katerina replies with e5, playing as black. Now knight f3, knight c6, both players played their standard openings with no early surprises and we see a rather classical Italian here. Now, black goes with bishop to e7, which is the second most popular line. Sometimes we see bishop to c5 more often, but this is still very classical and normal development for black as well. Both players castle, and now we see bishop to b3 from Leiting J, which is saving the bishop in a very normal way by repositioning it to c2 eventually even though the main line here is usually to go for rook e1 as white and then later play either c3 or bishop or a4 with later playing bishop to b3. So still a very normal plan. Black goes d4, c3 from white and now knight to a5. So threatening to capture this bishop. And usually in these positions as white, you would rather not trade and keep this bishop for later because it can be strong in the attack, for example, if you manage to play d4 and e5 later on. Plus, you wouldn't trade it for a knight just yet, uh, while we still don't know if the position will open up. So black plays c5 here, controlling the d4 square, grabbing some space, and it is a very typical idea so far. So um, in this game, we see very classical plans from both sides. Rook to e1, knight c6 going back to the center, and now a3. So I think this is the biggest deviation that we have had so far, and I think from this moment on, both players were more or less out of theory and starting to play on their own and starting to spend time on their moves. Usually, something like knight b to d2 would still be uh, closer to theory, because then you would go for a typical plan as white with knight to f1, and from here the knight can go either to e3 or g3 and take one of these two squares, usually f5. And black can pursue a similar plan by repositioning their knight at some point to f4. So these are very classical plans, but a3 is the first sign that the position is getting a little bit different now. Katerina plays rook to e8 and Lady J justifies why she played her previous move and shows that her intention is to play b4. So this is a bit less common of a plan than knight d2 or let's say d4 for white, but still there's no big weaknesses and these two plans can still follow in combination with this b4 plan. So this is just trying to kick the knight potentially with b5 on the next move and just grabbing some space on the queen side. Now, black prevents b5 with the next move a6 and both players are trying to develop for now. And we see the moves h6 and h3, just two very typical prophylactic moves in this opening to usually prevent uh, the bishops from getting to g4 or to g5, um, but sometimes these pawns, even though this move is played very frequently, sometimes these pawns can become weaknesses and targets of bishop or knight sacrifices. And um, that's a good idea to keep in mind if you play these openings. It's a very common idea here. Now, black plays bishop to f8, just clearing up the space for the rook and potentially defending that pawn, also a common way to reposition. And now bishop to b2. So far it's a very solid game from both players and we will see how it's going to heat up in the next few moves. So black plays knight to h5. 
As I said, very often in these positions, it's a battle for either the f5 square or the f4 square. So black wants to put their knight onto f4. So it's not only the white knight that dreams of getting there. So white's knight tries to follow. The black knight gets there first, and now white also might want to play knight to f5 in the future. But black plays queen to f6, preventing this from happening uh, for the moment. And now we're starting to see that this very calm opening is only calm until a certain point, and tactics will start to happen um, here once all the pieces activate. So we see that black's pieces are really eyeing white's king here with the queen joined now it's getting a little bit more serious and white needs to create their own counterplay given that the knight cannot come to f5 right now it is time for some decisiveness from white and leighton j plays a critical move and finds the right moment for the pawn breakthrough she goes d4 here opening up the center black doesn't have to take, but then you leave white the option to do all sorts of captures. So it is the right idea for black to actually capture, and this is what happens in the game. Now the pawn captures back, and c takes on b4. Suddenly we realize that this was actually a pawn sacrifice from white, um, because the pawn on b4 is well protected by black so far. And of course, black didn't have to take on b4 and could have played c takes d4, but then this is looking like what white wanted in the first place with the bishops opening up. So she goes c takes b4, and after a takes b4, we will see how in the game Katerina Lagda was playing up a pawn. So she did end up getting this pawn. But there was a better move for white. It was bishop to c1, which looks very weird at first, but there is a very concrete idea behind it, so that if black does anything else, we are actually just going to take that knight on f4 and play knight to h5, trapping the queen. So this is more of a computer suggestion uh, of bishop to c1, but it just forces black to think and to retreat their pieces a bit more. But instead, in the game, we got a takes b4, knight takes b4, and bishop to b1. And I'm not sure which side you would rather play for, um, white with the center um, and two beautiful bishops, or black with the extra pawn. At this point it's still not clear, but there's for sure some compensation for that pawn from white. In the game, we will see how it unfolded, black plays a5, solidifying that extra pawn, now bishop to c1 with that same idea of potentially trapping the queen, but black sees it and plays knight to g6. And at first I really liked how white's position looked. So he played knight to h5, the queen got kicked out, and it seems for the moment that Leighton J is actually taking over. White's position is great, it's a pawn, but um, all of the pieces are really active. But she did make a few inaccuracies over the next few moves. So the best way to continue was to play d5 um, and close up the center actually, and then to play rook to a3, a really nice rook lift with potentially bringing the rook to the king side. And this position would have been preferable for white, but still stays really complicated. But instead she played bishop to d2, which is a bit more passive, um, but she wanted to activate the bishop somehow. And now she goes for this d5 idea, which was stronger on the previous move, but now it is not the same, and it's not as good with the bishop being on d2 right now. And black here plays knight to e5, all good so far. Knight d4, both knights got onto some strong squares, but queen to h4 happens from, from black now, and all of a sudden, I feel like the tables have really turned, and black is the one attacking now and also has the extra pawn so now we proceed to a very tense part of the game um, because we will see how strong black's attack becomes so white 
plays knight to g3 because they couldn't defend that knight there forever. Now g6 from black, taking control of some key squares and also making space for the bishop to go onto the strong long diagonal now. Now bishop takes on b4, so she decides to um, try to win back that pawn that, uh, that she was lacking as white. And at this point, Katerina is down to 20 minutes as black and Ting J is down to 6 minutes. So this is really getting closer to time trouble. And also the most complicated part of the game. And usually these, this time trouble matches the situation on the board because the player who feels like they're in a bit of trouble usually starts investing a bit more time into their moves and tries to become a bit more careful. And this displays their situation on the clock as well. So black takes the knight, of course, the bishop that traded itself for the knight. And after rook takes a8, rook takes a8, queen to b3. So as I said, she's going to try to regain that pawn because it is unpleasant to play just the full pawn down without any compensation on the other side of the board. Now, black could defend it with rook to a4, which is what I thought she would play. Um, but maybe she got scared of something like knight c6 um, tactic or knight to c2 regaining the pawn. Um, but she didn't try to. Um, keep that pawn and instead played bishop to g7. But the thing here is that white actually cannot take that pawn anyway because of that same rook to a4 idea, this time already targeting this knight while this bishop has also joined here. So there's going to be, you know, rook takes d4 for example and knight f3 uh, tactics available. So it's impossible for white to actually take it. But because of this, this knight had to move away it had no good squares, it moved back to e2. And here we are at one of the most critical moments of the game. And I would like you to pause the video and try to think of what you would play if you were in black's shoes here. I can even flip the board if that makes it easier. Um, what would you play? So if you are ready, I will start showing some variations. Maybe I'll flip it back to white. Um, just to continue the game that way. And at this point, there are a few options. If you chose something like rook to a4, that's a pretty good move. Keeping up the pressure, keeping the extra pawn. I have no complaints about that move. But there was something that happened in the game that was even more impressive. And that move was bishop takes on h3. Good job if you found that. This is an amazing sacrifice by Lagno and this is the best move uh, in the position. Now, in the game, white didn't take, but if she did, this would have been big, big trouble. Now, black can take queen takes on h3, which, it's, which is a very hard tactic to see because you're kind of giving the move to the opponent and giving them an opportunity to defend, but there's some huge threats here. So the threat is rook to a3 with the idea of knight f3 and if knight f3 ever comes on the board that's completely deadly and there's not much that white can do about it there's also knight to g4 threats in some lines so this is very tricky so for example the only more or less forcing move i see from white is knight to f4 but even there there's queen g4 and once again targeting that f3 square and um in all of these lines, no matter which move you choose for white, it is going to be winning for black. Knight of three ideas are always just way too strong and either almost checkmate the king or they also win back uh, the rook on e1. So bishop to h3, an amazing sacrifice and um, really great find by her. And Leiting J probably calculated all of these lines, realized that they're losing for white and decided to keep the game more complicated by not accepting the sacrifice and taking the pawn on before instead. Now, at this point, uh, I'm sure Katerina was looking for all sorts of tactics here, and there was almost a knockout move for black, which um, she didn't find in the game, but it is knight to g4. Looks a bit strange to trap your own bishop like that, but uh, I mean, there are some insane lines here for, for black. For example, if white plays f3, there is a move like rook to a3. 
sacrificing the rook and the thing is that if white takes like all of black's pieces are under it are under attack but they're also attacking the white king so well so there's bishop to d4 here another piece sacrifice and after knight to d4 queen g3 actually just wins the game uh, because of multiple checkmate threats everywhere and there's no way to defend all of it queen to e1 as well so as i've said this is just a sample line but there are some crazy lines here for um, black that are winning and uh, there's a couple of other ways to play as well and what katarina played doesn't spoil the position as much but it just loses the steam a bit off of the attack so she plays bishop to g4 still not spoiling it but knight g4 would have really uh, been much better and would have brought another piece in now queen to d6 followed by lating j and um, so far black is still doing great she played h5 keeping the momentum going and remember that ting j is under two minutes here so she's in deep time trouble um, but at least she got the d6 pawn and that's something to play for in these positions it's always important to find counterplay when you're on the defensive side so at least she has that extra uh that pass pawn that she can now uh, start creating her own threats with she goes queen to c7 here uh, trying to make space for that pawn and b5 so of course um, black wanted to defend that pawn and um, not lose it at any point d6 followed up and now lagno makes another inaccuracy knight to c4 and i think this was the one that probably cost her the clearly winning position that she had one of the last chances that she had to maintain um, winning a winning position here would have been to capture the knight actually and then after white recaptures you can play a slightly strange looking move like queen to g4 but it has its own merit so first of all you're defending against d7 pushes and you're also threatening h4 which is a huge threat considering both the rook and h3 you also have this rook that can join at some point with rook to a1 so the position would have still been really dominating with black's attack but instead knight to c4 kind of moves away a bit and uh, loses that momentum for black king j plays queen b7 and this the whole point of this knight c4 move which is why it was an inaccuracy is that it allowed white to go after this b5 pawn and as it turns out this pawn was actually pretty critical in black's winning chances uh, it looks like the king attack is great but that pass pawn was something that was also um, giving black an advantage on the other side of the board so now that it is gone black didn't bother defending it because then they can run into problems with white's passer and they traded both of these pawns for each other black still has no mate and when the play is only on one side of the board it is easier for the defensive side to uh to defend and um th these attacking positions are actually really difficult because as we saw the position that lagno had it was very dominating it looked like almost checkmate but if you do not see a very direct knockout or winning of material then you can get either frustrated and go for an unreasonable risk or you can also do what happened here which she played a couple of slow moves and that allowed the opponent to consolidate a bit more uh, and that's pretty much what happened in this game now there's, there's still white is still not out of the woods black is doing great and um she continued the attack with bishop to g uh, bishop to e5 and after queen d5 black plays queen g5 setting up some threats h4 maybe the bishop will move so still a lot of tactics left and at this point i would think that this was another critical moment of the game because here white finds a very important and super impressive move which she plays with less than 30 seconds on the clock i don't know about you i don't think i would have ever found this move in under 30 seconds but she goes here knight to f5 to me this is a shocking move and really an amazing find by her because we're at move 39 
it makes things complicated in time trouble and it uh, works out pretty well in some lines so one of black's best chances here is probably to go for bishop to h3 and um, then the knight would probably have to come back to defend and after knight to b5 um, black keeps uh, great winning chances so the knight cannot be taken because of bishop to h2 and overall the attack continues but instead it was the captures that both of them probably calculated more and what Lei Tingzhi had in mind when making this uh, interesting knight sacrifice. So if g takes to f5, I'm not sure how much of it they both actually saw in the game, but some of these lines are, are really great to see. So she does regain the, uh, the piece, but bishop to e2, this is something that I looked at and I just thought, oh, well, white is just losing a piece because after rook takes queen to c1, queen takes on b1, don't you just lose a piece? And it's true that you do. White does have some counterplay with queen to e7, but black also has a defense with queen b8. And this position was super difficult for me to evaluate. It's, according to the computer, it's equal after white finds some crazy moves like rook to b2 at some point. Uh, or you can also play queen g5, king here, and e5. Some perpetuals on the horizon pawns might fall the piece might not be enough to win but extremely complicated especially with so little time so i assume something like this is what white saw and thought that the piece wouldn't really be enough for a winning advantage and at least the king would be out of the attack so what actually happened in the game uh what katarina played was knight takes on f5 and that was actually her um final mistake that completely took away all winning chances. It's a bit unfortunate, but this knight to f5 was a great find that really complicated things. And what I think she had in mind here is that after she takes, of course, white's queen is under attack, so they will have to take back um, the bishop here. And after queen d2, maybe she thought that this is over and uh, both of these pieces are attacked and there is nothing to do. But white found a great resource once again, queen to c3 and now the issue is that black's knight is also attacked so you have to go for a trade of queens otherwise white is just going to capture this so in the game she probably realizes it at this point and this is move 40 so now they finally have 30 minutes each extra but all of the complicated parts are over and they settled for some exchanges and after queen takes on d2 um, there was some DGT error which said that the game continued with rook d4, but that's not what actually happened. I believe that she just took uh, the queen back and after e takes f5, king g7, f takes g6, the game ended in a draw. But I thought it was a super instructive game from both sides. Um, Lagno showed us how to attack, keep up the initiative, and that really amazing bishop takes h3 tactic. And... Lei Tingzhi showed us incredible calmness under time pressure and a very important skill of counter-attacking, creating counter chances even if you have a disadvantage on one side of the board. So this round, all of the other games ended in a draw um, and it might seem uneventful, but if you look at how these draws actually happen, then you'll see that it's a full-on fight on every board. So. Salimova and Tan Zhonggi was a draw, Anna Mozicek made a draw with Vaishali, and that game was also pretty interesting, and finally Gorechkina made a draw against Canero. Once again, peaceful results on those boards. But still, the tournament is heating up. I am really excited to see what the next rounds have in store for us, and thank you so much for joining, and I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.